<clears throat> Thank you for the introduction. <clears throat> it's a real pleasure to be here uh, back in New York where I did a lot of my training. It was also a pleasure to see Dr. Schmidt once again uh, amaze me at what he can accomplish with such a calm demeanor. <clears throat> um, after I finished my training here about a decade ago, and I was lucky enough to train under uh, Peter Ferries, uh, and therefore had probably more karate stents uh, as a graduating vascular fellow than anyone else in the country. And so I felt very comfortable using carotid stenting from a transfemoral access. <clears throat> um, and and I, I would say that I thought I knew everything I needed to know in terms of treating vascular disease as well as treating uh, carotid disease. And it's impressed me in the last decade of how much we continue to learn after, after we finish our, our formal training, um, largely because of the technology that, that comes upon us as we, uh, we kind of go through the years. So I think the en route system and transcervical access is a good example of, of some of that technology. I'm going to go over that for you today. These are my disclosures. Most relevant is the participation as a co-investigator in the Roadster trial. So we've already heard the, um, that carotid stenting is uh, some of the, the results of carotid stenting trials. Crest and ACT has, have clearly demonstrated that these are somewhat equivalent procedures in terms of overall outcomes of composite endpoints at, at uh, early and, and late term. Uh, and I think the CAS debate, uh, we've shifted away from, from arguing CAS versus CEA, and really CAS has been de clearly demonstrated as being a safe and effective modality, and we're now focusing on optimizing, further optimization of our, our CAS outcomes. Um, and I think there's good reason to do that, because even though the, the uh, formal um, endpoint of uh, stroke death and MI was equivalent uh, between these procedures and the CREST trial, certainly we saw a higher MI rate in patients treated with CEA, and, uh, and unfortunately, a higher stroke rate in those patients in CREST that were treated with uh, carotid uh, stenting. And so, you know, if you consider that the, the, stroke is the stroke is what we're really trying to prevent with any carotid intervention, it's important to note that all stroke at 30 days was significantly higher in, in CAS, and all stroke in major ipsilateral stroke was higher in CAS at four years. Um, so some of the technology that's evolved to deal with this, of course, distal embolic protection, uh, listed at the top. We saw a case of proximal uh, protection with the MoMA device, and then the newest comer to this arena is the transcervical access with the in route uh, system by Silk Road. So this system basically uses a, a small uh, a horizontal incision just above the clavicle, really about one to two centimeters in length, very different than a carotid endorectomy incision. This is done under local anesthesia in which we insert the sheath directly into the carotid just above the clavicle, and then establish a flow reversal circuit here where the blood goes through a filter and then is returned to the venous system at the, at the femoral vein. Uh, this is the, the newest iteration of the NROUT system, which we didn't have in trial. It's really have some good improvements. And, and I would say that there are three main advantages of this uh, strategy compared to transfermal stenting. One is that we establish embolic protection proximal to the lesion. So we're, we're establishing pro, uh, a protection strategy before we cross the lesion with any wire or catheter. Um, similar to, to the MoMA device with proximal protection. Second, flow reversal. This is essentially like continuous surgical back, back bleeding. So it's not, not an option we have with transfemoral stenting, but it is something very helpful. And then finally, avoiding the aortic arch is probably one of the most important um, aspects of this procedure. Uh, establishing embolic protection before crossing lesion is, is really quite important. Uh, multiple trials have looked at where we get TCD hits or we, where we get evidence of microemboli, and it's been shown that even during sheath placement and wire manipulation across a lesion, we do have a significant number of hits. So establishing that proximal protection before crossing lesion, I think, is an important point. The second of flow reversal, this is, this is uh, the crux of the, of, the, uh, of the protection system in general. And, um, you know, when we're doing a carotid endorectomy and we develop clot above our, 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 um, our filter po or our clamp point, uh, vasospasm and thrombus, we can flush all of that out by taking off our clamp at the end and back bleeding. This is not something that we have access to in, in transfemoral stenting. And so because of the variable uh, porosity of the filters, which we've heard a little bit about, because of the possibility of thrombus above the filter, we have no good way of dealing with this with transfemoral stenting. And this is, this is an area where flow reversal is very helpful to avoid some of these issues. Finally, avoiding the aortic arch is probably the most important. Um, of, of course, we all know that there are new DW MRI lesions with both CAS and CEA. Um, these are common after all carotid interventions, and there is increasing evidence that these, are, these uh, MRI, MRI lesions are linked to neurologic decline. Now, it's clear that the incidence and location of these varies depending on the modality of, of carotid intervention, with CAS giving us bilateral uh, uh, hits, and that suggests really that arch manipulation is an important factor. 
When we look at studies that have looked at carotid endorectomy and carotid stenting that have included the use of, of MRI pre and post-op, we find that, again, the, the, the presence of these lesions is, is ubiquitous across all different modalities, with CEA having about a 20 percent hit rate uh, with new MRI lesions compared to about 80 percent with transfemoral stenting. Now, when we go to a, a, a proximal embolic protection device where we establish protection before crossing lesion, we see that that, that, uh, that hit rate drops by about half to 45 percent in the profi trial. Looking at the um, proof trial, which included the first 50 or so patients treated with uh, transcervical access and, and flow reversal, we saw that the rate of new DWMRI lesions was 19 percent. So this is akin to a carotid endorectomy and suggests that avoiding the arch is really pretty important. Um, these are some of the papers, a couple of which are from Wei Zhao, a surgeon uh, now in, in um, Arizona, that's looking into the, the link between these new DWMRI lesions and cognitive decline. And she's, she's uh, presented at the American Surgical and other important meetings with some pretty compelling evidence that we do have to start worrying about these lesions. So if we, if we avoid the transfemoral access and arch manipulation and cut out some of these DWI MRI lesions, hopefully we'll have decreased neurocognitive decline as well as perhaps lower event rates during our procedure itself. So is there evidence for this? Well, in the, in the Roadster trial, this was the IDE trial that got approval for this device. Uh, this is a prospective single-arm multicenter registry looking at the en route system that enrolled in the pivotal portion 141 patients at 18 sites, both symptomatic and asymptomatic high-risk patients. So these are all high-risk patients, and we looked at 30-day stroke death and MI as well as 12 months. And if you look at the 12-month uh, outcomes, you can see that these, these results uh, speak for themselves. Um, major stroke and minor stroke under 2 percent, and all of these being minor strokes, essentially. Uh, the composite of stroke and death being under 3 percent uh, in both the uh, pivotal uh, intention to treat and per protocol analysis. So these are results that are, are better than any other prospective uh, clinical trial or, um, or randomized trial to date. If we compare these to some of the other trials, and obviously these are these uh, are, aren't side by side uh, trials, or we're sort of comparing um, trials that are, are done in a similar fashion and similar um, core lab adjudication, but they're obviously not uh, you know all part of a single trial. So you can take this a little bit with a grain of salt. But you do notice that in terms of the surgical high risk patients, the Roadster trial uh, did much better than the the SVS registry of high risk patients. And if you look at standard risk, the only the only patients, the only group in all of these trials that did as well as the high surgical risk Roadster patients or transcervical stenting uh, patients, where the seat was the CEA arm of Act One. And so this is again pretty compelling evidence that a new bar for carotid stenting should be a stroke rate of, of under two percent. Um, what about specific high-risk patients? So obviously symptomatic patients are known to be higher risk of, of uh, complications with stenting, and in the Roadster trial we saw the symptomatic patients had zero, uh, zero strokes, no strokes in this group, with a stroke and death rate of under 3 percent. Um, obviously, octogenarians and older patients have, uh, have commonly been shown to have uh, worse outcomes with carotid stenting uh, compared to carotid endorectomy. Some of these trials are listed here that demonstrated this. Our group has looked at arch morphology over the years uh, as people age and found that as people get older, they tend to have arch elongation that leads to a higher rate of type 3 arch or unfavorable arch anatomy. And this may be one of the reasons why these older patients do less well. They, they have a, an elongated arch or a more hostile arch. When we looked at the um, octogen or the patients o over the age of 75 in the Roadster trial, we again found no strokes in this group and a stroke and death rate of 3 percent. So it doesn't seem that symptomatic status or age seems to impact our results with the transcervical access. Um, obviously, we've all seen this slide. The, 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 um, the, um, we've had improvements in all sorts of, of issues in terms of carotid stenting, and, and you could say that part of the reason these newer trials are, are showing better outcomes is we've just evolved our technique and patient selection. I think that's true, but I would point out that three of these five trials that have really shown exceptional results have been some type of uh, proximal protection. Just real quickly, I, I, you know, the question then is should all patients be treated with TCAR? I think that, um, that it's worth considering. Uh, certainly patients like this one where I had to use a, a VTEC with a telescoping sheath to just get access, a coil in the distal SFA as well as a critical stenosis. It's in the mid portion of the carotid. Uh, stiff angle glide wire to keep our, my sheath in position using a double buddy wire technique to establish my EPD. These are cases I simply won't do anymore. These are ones I think are, are very appropriate for trans cervical access. Uh, some of the disadvantages to this procedure, I'll kind of skip these and just highlight a, a couple. The working distance with TCAR, this is what we have when we're working with a transfemoral stent. When we go through a TCAR procedure, we're putting our sheath in right here. So this short working distance is, is, is an issue that we need to be mindful of. There's only one short delivery system for this stent, an open cell stent. I think we do need more stent. 
stents available. And then finally, I think we haven't worked out the, um, the training paradigms yet. You know, I, I've said many times that once you establish your sheath and position, it makes carotid so, uh, stenting so easy that a monkey can do it. But I do think, I do think we need to sort out exactly um, how to go about training people with this new procedure. Um, I think you do need a background with, uh, with endovascular interventions and transfemoral stenting, and you need a, the same gentle hand that all of us use when transfemoral stenting. So for, uh, in terms of conclusions, transcervical carotid uh, artery revascularization is probably worth considering in all patients, more likely to benefit some patients than others, such as unfavorable arch anatomy, target tortuosity, uh, older patients, uh, diseased uh, arch vessel origins, and symptomatic patients. But I think we must be mindful of the potential pitfalls and training requirements for any new technology. Thank you.